Hey guys, thanks for leaving all the thumbs up and the comments in my last video. In this video, we will talk about how I built it. So here's our agenda. I'll talk about baby steps, how I break down what I want to do into smaller steps that's easier to manage. We'll talk about pull-up resistors and input pull-up parameter, and what to do when you run out of digital pins, such as in this project where I use a lot of the pins for the 7 segment. I ran out of pins for the button. <laughs> Of course, we'll talk about the seven segment display, which is the centerpiece of the project and how to drive it without any extra chips. Even though one of you guys with eagle eyes noticed that there was actually a shift register in the Arduino kit, which I could have used. We'll talk about using interrupts and timers to automatically refresh the display without having to worry about it once you set it up. If you are already familiar with all these topics, feel free to skip this video and I'll see you in the next video. Otherwise, let's get started. A habit that I find useful is to break down a project into smaller pieces. Even for a simple project as this rolling dice, there are a lot of little pieces, and although you can't tackle everything all at the same time, it is much easier to break it down and tackle one piece at a time, get that piece working, and once you're sure that piece is working, you go take another piece, and that way when something don't work, you know where the broken piece is. Whenever we work with an Arduino, of course, we gotta make sure that we choose the right one. This is an Arduino Uno. Make sure it's uh, visible on the port. Yep, port 21. And then uh, I always upload the blink sketch just to make sure that it actually communicates. So control U to upload. Done uploading. And there is our blinky. So now that we know everything is working right, we could start working on some code. <laughs> To detect the shaking of the dice, we need some sort of input. Although the kit doesn't come with any accelerometer, it comes with this. It kind of looks like a capacitor, doesn't it? This is an electrolytic capacitor, and this is the tilt switch. I've never actually opened one, but according to the internet, there is basically one or two balls in here, and when it's resting like this, the ball closes the contact between these two leads. And what is surprising is how sensitive this thing is, <laughs> considering it's just mechanical. You could hear the ball. I almost think it was too sensitive for the rolling of the dies. Okay, so let's talk about pull-up resistors. This is usually a 1K or 10K resistor just to pull it up to a positive or high or 5 volts. The reason we have this resistor here is because had we not have it, we will have this situation right here. So there will be the input to the Arduino and there will be a switch here. And when the switch is not pushed, all we have in here is a floating pin which is neither low nor high. And that's just a bad habit, I think. It's just a better habit to always define it either high or low. So when you don't press this, that's the path of least resistance of 1K. So that will become high when you don't press the button. When you press the button, this will become zero ohm. So this is the path of least resistance. And so this will become low or zero. So press it, become zero, release it, becomes one which may be kind of backward to some of you, and you are welcome to flip this. So you can put the switch on the positive side. That still go to the I.O. pin. And then put the resistor to pull it down to ground. So now, when you don't press it, it is naturally pulled down to ground. This is still the 1K resistor. So that will become low. When you press that, so now we, this has become the least resistance, and it will become 5 volts. So that's also valid. But the reason I picked this is because there is an actual command on the Arduino that will allow you to have this inside the Arduino itself. So instead of putting it in here, you would put it inside the Arduino. Something like this. So this is the inside the Arduino itself. By sending a special command, the Arduino itself will put a resistor internally. So let's test that in the code. So here's our blink sketch. It's amazing how many of my code actually started with a blink. <laughs> so let's add our tilt switch input. So the LED is on digital pin 13 and the uh, switch is on digital pin 12 right next to it. And then we tell it that instead of an output like the LED, we want this switch to be an input. And here's the cool thing. <laughs> if you say input pull up, not only it will make this pin an input pin, but it will also hook up the resistor inside the Arduino chip itself which is pretty cool. So you do not have to have the external resistor anymore. Unfortunately, you can only do an input pull up. There's no such thing as a input pull down. That doesn't exist. <laughs> That's why I prefer the input pull up because it is supported by the Arduino. 
Next, we want to check the switch. So if it is high, we want to do something. I'm going to repeat this blink three times. And I also want to make it a little shorter. And then we also need a closing for that guy. You see how messy this is? Normally you would clean this up by putting tabs and stuff. But there's a much easier way to do that. If you do a control T, it formats it for you. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Let me change one more thing. Instead of using digital pin 12, I'm going to use analog pin 5. This is maybe another little known trick on the Arduino that you can use analog pins as digital inputs. In my case, I use all the LED pins to draft the 7 segment display and I ran out of digital pins. I don't like using D0 and D1 because those are being used by the Arduino when you upload and download programs. And I also do not like using D13 as an input because it has the LED output on it. Basically, I'm out of digital pins. Fortunately, I do not have any need for an analog input for this project. Therefore, I'm free to use all my analog inputs as digital input or output. And everything else stays the same. So you could say that it is an input pull up so you can still do a digital read even though this still switch as you can see as an analog input. It will work just fine. Let me show you. So here is our tilt switch connected to analog 5 and then the other side of the switch is connected to ground. Here is the LED completely off but as soon as we have any vibration at all it starts blinking and if we tilt it a lot it will continue on blinking. Yeah like that. So we got that working. What's next? So the kit didn't come with any documentation for this display, but it's not really that difficult to figure out the pinouts. I'll link to a previous video I did about how to figure this out in here. For this particular display, basically we have four common anode positives, and then uh, all the negative segments are hooked up together among all the displays. So let's say you want to put a number 7 here, so you want to light up segment A, B, and C. To do that, you would put a positive here, a plus 5 here, and then you ground segments A, B, and C. So A goes all the way here, B goes to here, and C is here. So if you put negative here and a positive here, you will get a number 7. Of course, because of this, you can only have one at a time to control. You can have a different digit on every one of these numbers, but obviously people do. And I'll share how to do that later. So this is how we wire up the display. So the common anodes the, for the digits are connected to these pins, which is D2 through D5. Those are the white wires here, D2 through D5. And then the yellow wires are for the segments. So that is connected. So segment A through G are connected to Arduino pins 6 through 12. And then between them are these current limiting resistors, 220 ohms. And you could kind of see them hiding in there somewhere. Yeah, right there. <laughs> it's pretty packed in there. So as I mentioned before, to light up any of these displays, all you have to do is just put in the right positive on the right digit and the right negative on the correct segments. And of course, we could control these pins here using the digital write on the Arduino. So let's look at some code. So this is the code that I specifically wrote to test the display. Make sure that I actually understand how it's wired. Then when I set a particular pin, that it actually does what I expect it to do. Again, this is back to the baby step thing. Like if you don't do this and you just assume you get everything right, when things don't work right, you don't really know whether it's a wiring problem or is it because you got the pin wrong here or what. By writing this program specifically to go through every single segment one at a time and making sure that what you think you're asking the computer to do actually happens. <laughs> so this is very useful. So all I did here is basically define some constants. And then I also like doing this again to break things down. There's a setup. And even though you could put all the setup code in here, I like to break them down saying, OK, I'm going to set up my inputs here. I'm going to set up my outputs here. And those routines are up here, as you said before. So it keeps it very clean. So if you have other inputs that you want to add on, you know exactly where to put it rather than just like, uh, I don't know, stick it right over here. Like <laughs> so. It's good to have some structure. Okay, so that's setup input and setup output. Let's go backward from the main loop. After setting up the inputs and output, the only thing we're going to do is just run this test. So all this test does is call this one, which is again, we break it down to testing each digit. 
So digit 0 is what I call the rightmost, this is the second from the rightmost, and then this is the leftmost. And they all call the same routine, flash A through G, which are the segments. So if you go up in here, flash A through G is given what digit we are testing, and it will just flash each of those segments manually one at a time in the sequence that you want. And as we talked about earlier, to light up any segment, all we have to do is just set which digit you want to set high, and then you ground the segment that you want to light up, and when you're done, you turn off that digit, so you're ready for the next time this is called for a different digit. And this one is simply basically a blink. So all it does is says, hey, whatever segment they told us to do, bring it low. Remember, we have a common anode positive. So this is the positive pin on the H digit. And then each of the segment will supply the negative. The segment will light up, wait a little bit, and then we turn it back off. So that's all it does. Let's say we have one of the segments wrong. When it goes through this, the wrong segment will light up and you'll say, hey, is that because I got the wrong pin constant over here? Or because I wire it wrong? Or because I look at the pinouts of the uh, display wrong? Whatever. But by doing this, we are now sure that when we say I want a digit zero segment A, it will actually do what we tell it to do. Now that we have confirmed that the wiring is right, and we know how to control each segment, it's time to display digits. It is very tempting to create a routine for each digit. So you would have a routine for zero, and then you set with a segment for zero, and then you have a, another routine for one, and then you set the segments for one. But that becomes quite lengthy. Instead of writing a routine to set the segments for each digit, it is much more efficient to set a bit pattern for each digit. So this bit here, is associated with a segment A, B, C, D, and etc. So for the digit one, for instance, the only two segments that are on is the second and third segment, B and C. So this is a lot more efficient than creating a routine for every digit. So let me scroll down to the code that actually used that array. So display digit takes two parameters, which digit this number is for, and what number you want to display. And as before, we turn on the common anode for that particular digit, and then this loop here goes through every bit that is in here, and for each of the bits that has a 1 in it, it will turn on the appropriate segment. So this is very similar to the previous program. The only difference now, as you can see, is I'm displaying different numbers for each digit, and that is set by this number right here. The current value is 1, 2, 3, 4. I'm intentionally doing this very slowly, so you can see each digit set to a different number. All this should look familiar as before. The digits should be similar. But what is different now is there is nothing in the main loop anymore. So we're not doing the digit test or anything in here. So who is drawing those digits then? <laughs> well, this is the magic of interrupts and timers. I'm using this library called Timer1. So you can write a routine that will be called automatically, periodically, outside the loop. So you can concentrate on doing other things in the loop, such as rolling a dice. And timer1 will take care of all the refreshing as we are seeing right now. So to do that, there is a new setup right here. And it called the library to initialize it. So this parameter tells timer1 how often this routine should be called. And basically, you could do just about anything within that routine. So every time we get called, we're going to turn off the current digit that we were displaying before. We go to the next digit. All this stuff is string manipulation to figure out what is the value of the digit. And then we call the draw digit like before. And then once those segments are set correctly, we turn on the common anode and that shows that digit. And that stays there until our refresh digit get called again. And this time we will turn off that last digit that we just showed. Go to the next one, display the next one, enable it so you could see it, and so on and so forth. And currently it looks kind of lame because it's really slow. But if you speed this up, see, I think 4000 is pretty good. Let me upload this. I mean, it looks so solid. There's no flicker whatsoever because it's updating it every 4000 microseconds, which is 4 milliseconds. I don't know how many times per second that is, but it's a lot. <laughs> so many times that you can't see it flicker. And then because of this, we can change the value and we don't have to worry about refreshing the screen anymore. So that's what this routine does here. 
all it does is count from 0 through 9999 and then I set the curve value which we, we were displaying there 1 2 3 4 there uh, to that number you may be wondering what these two lines are for remember we're being called by this timer interrupt every 4000 microseconds completely independent from the loop so basically we're multitasking on the Arduino isn't that cool <laughs> so we need to make sure that when we are changing this it is not currently being used by the refresh digit so we have to kind of do a pause say don't call refresh digits while I change this value and then as soon as I'm done changing that value you could continue on calling this every 4000 microseconds so that's what that is I got one last thing to cover somewhere up here is the keyword volatile the rest of this is the same usual stuff you know uh, like long int byte whatever but by adding the keyword volatile that tells the compiler not to optimize these variables and that is important because remember we are doing this multitasking thing so we can't have it such that when it's in here that variable is in stored in some CPU register and when it's down here it's stored in a different CPU register so by saying volatile it will make sure that it's actually in RAM not in some internal register so you need to use the, the keyword volatile for every variable that may be accessed by the main loop and by the interrupt routine here so let me call this routine and there it is <laughs> it's counting from 0 through 9999 uh, every 10 milliseconds so now basically we could control every digit display whatever number we want in there and that's basically the basis of that rolling dice I just trigger it with a switch we as we talked about before and then I set the digits to whatever number it should be and you know putting a loop that makes it go back and forth the last thing I added was the beeping and all it is just setting that high and low to create a little ticking sound I hope you guys learned a thing or two if I didn't explain something well enough and you have some questions don't hesitate to ask any questions I'll be happy to answer them well this video is getting pretty long thanks for sticking out till the end guys I better stop and I'll talk to you guys later bye